right? So we can start from here. So now the chromatin remodeling comes in, right? Now notice here, there's another acetylation on lysine 14, right? This was lysine 9, now we have lysine 14, and again over here too, right? So additional acetylation. Now the chromatin remodeling complex comes in, this large group of proteins, which are also coactivators, right? And then we have now our transcription factor 2D, which binds to the Tata box, right? And then obviously the other stuff is going to come in, the rest of the machinery that we have discussed in the previous, right? If I go back over here, right? And essentially we have transcription, okay? So all of these events have to take place in order for us to be able to transcribe our genes. Okay, so we have to loosen the structure a little bit, these chemical modifications. So that's how critical the chemical modifications are in controlling gene expression. And of course, the chemical modifications take place on the tails of the histones. Okay, so now, here now, what we're doing, we're zeroing in on the transcriptional activators, right? So essentially here, we see four different ways that the transcriptional activators can essentially uh, uh, behave, right? So in A here, you see the transcriptional activator binding here, and it basically promotes the binding of additional factors. So now this blue one is going to bind there, right? And of course, this is the promoter. So that's one way that they can act. Another way is that by binding here, it then helps to recruit the RNA polymerase to the promoter. And of course, without the RNA polymerase, you're not going to have gene expression, right? The third way it behaves, it releases the RNA polymerase to begin transcription. So not only does, does it facilitate the binding of the RNA polymerase, but it also kickstarts the process as well. And so this is to begin transcription. And also, sometimes the activator, what it does, it releases the RNA polymerase if the RNA polymerase pauses, right? So if the RNA polymerase begins to read, and then at some point it just stops there, the, 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 the activator can bind, and then this will continue to read again. Yeah? What makes the DNA polymerase uh, unbind for the other kind of factors? Well, this is, not, this is transcription, not, 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 not replication, because I think fragments are in replication, right? So don't confuse that. Two different things. So these are four different ways that transcriptional activators can affect transcription, basically, right? Straightforward. OK. So this is very important, too, because it shows us that these transcriptional activators also work synergistically, which means what, Carl? Synergistically. They work together. Exactly. They yeah. work together, right? They work together. Carl knows about synergistic work because he has worked with other people together, right? In many different capacities, right? EMT, oh, right? Yeah, I was just making sure we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> EMT, right? Carl is an EMT. He works synergistically with other in the EMT, right? Okay, so over here now, we see, obviously, the promoter region, the Tata box, and these are the other regions, right? The regulatory regions that can affect transcription. So if nothing binds to them, Gaetano, what would you expect to happen? If nothing binds to the regulatory regions, no transcription. That's exactly right. No transcription, right? Now, if one of them binds, right, well, you can have some transcription, right? Now, it could be this one or this one, right? So you can have transcription. And if both of them bind, you also have transcription. But what do you notice there, Sam? Yes, a lot more transcription, right? A lot more transcription. And this was based on an experiment they did where they took the regulatory region and then they added, right? They added either one transcriptional activator or the other one or both, right? And when they added both, they noticed that essentially you had a lot more transcription. So this tells us that there is synergy between the activators, right? Together, they work much better than individually. Yes? 
Right. So maybe because this one is closer to the promoter, so therefore it affects it a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. So again, this is data from an experiment where it was an in vitro experiment where they took this piece of DNA and they added the activator separately or together, and then they measured the rate of transcription. Pretty amazing stuff, right? So again, it reveals synergy, working together. Okay, now, in addition to activators, of course we have repressors, right? We have repressors. And repressors by their name, what do they do? They suppress transcription, they repress transcription, right? So here now we have different five, six different ways, right? Six different mechanisms by which repressors can inhibit transcription, right? So the first one is very simple to understand, is competitive DNA binding. So we have these regulatory regions in the DNA right here, right? And you can see there's a binding site for the activator shown in green, and there is a binding site for the repressor shown in red. So it's like musical chairs, right? Who gets there first determines what's going to happen. So if the repressor gets there first, guess what? This guy cannot bind because half of that binding site now is occupied, right? So and if I sit on this chair, right, nobody else can sit on this chair. Now if I sit like this, right? It will be difficult for somebody else to come and sit either, right? So therefore, if I'm sitting here and occupying this space, I get to choose what's going to happen next, right? So if this guy sits there, we're going to repress. If this guy sits there, obviously we're going to activate, right? So competition between the activator and the repressor for DNA binding. So now this one is slightly different. It's masking the activation side. Now remember, right, we said the activator, this is on the surface, is the, the site where it's going to interact with other ones. So if I go back a few, right, if I go back to here, so here's the activator, here is the finding site activating with the mediator, for example, right? Okay, so now what we're going to do is essentially inhibit it by the repressor. So the repressor can bind to a separate binding site, but then it binds to the activation surface, and then this one now can no longer bind, right? It can no longer bind to the mediator, and therefore you're not going to activate transcription. You're going to suppress transcription because you're preventing the activator from interacting with other parts of the transcriptional initiation complex, right? Over here now is direct interaction with the general transcription factor. So here's our friend, transcription factor 2D, right? And we know that 2D binds to the TADA box, right? And there it is, binding to the TADA box. And over here now, you see that the DNA, shown in gray, actually bends, which we've seen that before. So here is now the repressor binding to the transcription factor 2D, which then inhibits then the binding of this one, right? So this guy binds there, it inhibits the transcription. So therefore, you have an inhibitory signal. Over here, the fourth uh, way that it can suppress transcription is by recruitment of the chromatin remodeling complexes, right? And essentially here, what you're doing, here is the repressor, and essentially, helps to recruit this chromatin remodeling complex, which could be an inhibitory remodeling complex. And notice what happened, right? What does the picture show there? Good, so there's a ton of box there, right? It's no longer accessible because what happened? What's that? Well, not more specifically than just shuffling. It got more condensed, exactly. We went from a loose structure, this chromatin remodeling complex made it more compact. And if the DNA is more compact, right, you don't have space for the proteins to bind to the regulatory elements to transcribe the gene, right? So that's it. Okay. Yes. Of course, and we talked about that, right? Remodeling complexes can do both. 
data remodeled, right? This would be like everything. Yes, so this would be one where it makes it more compact, right? But we've seen remodeling complexes make it loose before too, right? Right. Good. So now, over here now is recruitment of the histone deacetylases. So in other words, the, the repressor recruits the histone deacetylase. Well, if it's a deacetylase, what is it going to do? Remove the acetyl groups. If you remove the acetyl groups, what happens, right? What's that? It becomes more compact again. So here's the depressor, right? Here's the histone deacetylase. You're going to remove this, so you're going to create a more compact structure. And finally, the recruitment of histone methyl transferase. The methyl transferase does what for us? Anybody? It methylates. And what do we say about methylation? It silences, exactly, it silences, right, precisely. So if you start now methylating, right, essentially you put these methyl groups on, right, on the histones, and you recruit now these proteins that bind to the methylated histones, and guess what? This is a very compact structure. So you can transcribe. So that's how you inhibit, you repress the transcription, right? So basically the repressors can function in these seven different ways that we, or six different ways that we outline here, basically. Is everybody clear? Good, okay. So, now, this one here shows us that essentially sometimes there are DNA sequences that can affect uh, different genes, right? Uh, or distant genes, for example. And we call those insulators, right? So here now we have gene A, here we have gene B, right? And these are the cis regulatory sequences for this one and this. And in blue here, it shows us the insulator element. And again, the word element here simply means a DNA sequence, right? A DNA sequence. So we have a specific DNA sequence here and a specific DNA sequence. And notice it tells us. This is a domain of an actively transcribed chromatin, right? Why? Because we have genes. So now, over here, what you see, you have a specific protein called the insulator binding protein. So this insulator binding protein binds here, and it can also bind over here. And when it does that, essentially, you can see that this cis regulatory element for this gene here can actually affect this gene, right? Normally, this can affect this one, but it can affect this one. And that's what you see here, okay? So this coming in and affecting this gene. So what insulators do, they directly block the action of the cis regulatory sequences where a barrier sequences prevent the spread of heterochromatin, right? And you don't want heterochromatin because it's compact. You want it loose. So, yes, exactly. So instead of blocking the gene, it blocks the gene? Yes. It is not blocked, right? right. So it, it affects B, gene B, precise, precisely, because this is part of gene A, but yet it affects gene B in this, in this. Yes, of course the transcription of gene B, always the transcription, right? This is what we're talking about transcription. So over here, these are actually uh, uh, chromosome uh, images of Drosophila, right? The fruit fly, and here you can see these regions Okay, where the binding proteins can bind and affect, right? So again, so this one shows us that specific sequences, regulatory sequences in the DNA that are part of one gene can, in essence, affect a neighboring gene, right? That's all it tells us, right? That's all it tells us. Okay, so now we're going to shift a little bit and actually look at some of these events that take place with real data. So this is the, ex the expression of transcription regula regulators during Drosophila embryogenesis, right? And of course, Drosophila is, you see here what we have are the larvae, right? And this shaded colors that you see here is, indicates what? Steven, what do you think it indicates, Steven? The shaded parts that we see with the color. Uh, it's a different gene. Yes, different genes, which genes? Bicoid, Giant, Hunchback, and Krupel. These are all transcriptional regulators, right? These are all transcriptional regulators. 
and it shows us here their expression pattern, right? Now notice, this is the anterior part of the larvae. This is the posterior. So this will give rise to what? The head of the fly. This one, the back of the fly, right? Okay, so notice that they are expressed in different. So this one is predominantly here. This one is here. This one is somewhere in the middle, croupel. And then giant is expressed in both regions, posterior and anterior, right? Now, why is this very important? Because the expression of these four transcriptional regulators, in essence, regulate the body structure of Drosophila that we're going to see in the next slide. So here now, it shows us another gene called even skipped, right? And even skipped, I'm going to shut the light so you can actually see this much better. It'll pop out, right? So look at this, right? And the reason why the gene is called even skipped is because it basically shows this pattern, okay, of expression, right? These are different segments in the Drosophila embryo that will give rise to different body structures, right? And I'm going to show you that in just a second. So we have now identified these critical transcriptional regulators that control the body pattern of Drosophila. And if you mess with these transcriptional regulators, you can mess the Drosophila. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. So here is now an experiment that was done, right, where they took the, they control the expression of even skip, for short Eve, right? By manipulating its regulatory elements, right? So this is normal DNA, and you can see here the Eve gene, which is the even skip gene, right? And essentially, this is the promoter. Remember, this is the start of transcription. So this is upstream, right? This is downstream. And over here, you can see all these regulatory elements or regulatory DNA sequences, and there's multiple ones, right? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bands, right? In the Drosophila, of course, this te the technique that was used to get this data is what? Not in situ hybridization. That's exactly right. So we are looking at the expression of even skip in this part of the Drosophila embryo. Okay, so this is normal, right? Now, look at this now, what they did. They took this regulatory element or regulatory piece of DNA, stripe number two, right? And then they created a fusion DNA. So they did this in the lab, right? Where they just inserted just this segment over here, no other ones. So none of this, not even this one or this one, just number two. And then they wanted to, to drive this, right? They put the powder box to drive lag Z. Now lag Z is a gene that is expressed in normally bacteria and in the code for beta galactosidase, right? So now what they did, they transfected this into the embryo of the, of the Drosophila, and they look for expression, and look at this. So where is this expressed? Exactly where two, right? So that's how they determine this controls stripe one, this controls stripe two, uh, sorry, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So each one of this piece of DNA that is upstream of the promoter for the Eve gene controls its expression at a particular location in the embryo, during embryogenesis of Drosophila, okay? And they've done all sorts of experiments, and this down here summarizes the binding of these critical transcription factors, right? At the different regions of the stripe two. This is just stripe two, right? So we are taking this little box and we are extending it and now we are seeing that multiple transcription regulators can bind to just stripe two, right? This one. So notice, here is giant, here is Krupa. These are depressors. And here we have bicoid and we have hunchback. These are activators. 
Now notice by could by here, 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 and here, right? Notice here, this is Krugel repressor, this is bicoid activator. What do we see here? Yes, binding to the same side. So there's competition, right? Over here, this is giant, this is bicoid. Repressor, activator, competition, right? Competition, okay? And over here, competition. And over here, competition, okay? So whoever wins, transcription or repression will take place, right? Yeah. Yeah, of course, yes. So yeah. I'm going to show you in just a second. Okay, so is everybody with me so far? Okay, good. I'm going to keep this because it's beautiful images. I think that's the end. Yeah, sorry. So, now this shows you essentially What does this show us before I tell you? Did somebody explain this figure to me? Yeah. Go ahead, Melina. Good, exactly. It shows us the relationship between the activators and repressor, but a little bit more specific. So we have the concentration of the of the activators or repressors, right? The regulators on the y-axis. On the x-axis, we see the position along the embryo, anterior versus posterior, correct? So what do we see here? And this is stride two. Well, it makes sense, but let's, let's look at it. So hunchback, now let me go back, right? Hunchback, bicoid, and activators for stride two, right? Whereas giant and crupel are impressors. So here now, what do we see in this, in this area? The activators. Uh, sorry, uh, hunchback and bicoid are present. The repressors are what? Well, giant and Kruger, but they're absent, right? Look at their, their levels are high over here. And that's why the gene is not expressed here or here because the repressors are in high concentration, right? But here the repressors are in low concentration, but what do we find? the activators in high concentration, and that's why the gene is expressed, which is basically, basically what you just said. So does that make a difference here to the activator? Yes, exactly. So in, in fact, these guys here control all the, the, the all the striping, okay. these, these, these regulatory, transcriptional regulators, as we call them. So is everybody clear? Yes? Right? So now you can see the interaction, basically, right, of all these molecules and how they control gene expression, right? So this is a great example of demonstrating regulation of gene expression by transcriptional regulators or repressors, right? Whichever ones. Okay, so now we have to control the activity of these regulatory molecules, right? So how do we control it? Obviously, so you can see here, for example, by protein synthesis. If you don't have the activator and you make it, okay, it's present. If you don't have the repressor and you make it, okay, it's present. So what determines how we make either the repressor or the activator? Well, oh, yes, but before that. Before that, the ultimate. The signals that come to the cells, right? The signals that come to the cells. So if you go back one, right? If you notice here, we have a lot of cells, right? There's cell to cell interaction, right? Signals come into the cell, right? So all of those, right? So a signal comes in, and of course, this can happen protein synthesis. So you go from inactive, well, it's not there, it's not really inactive, it's not there, to being there. Over here, ligand like binding, right? So essentially, you can have a molecule that can bind to and activate, right? Over here, you can have covalent modification. So that means that you can chemically modify the protein. In this case, ours, what kind of modification do we have here? Phosphorus. 
Phosphorylation, exactly. Notice, look at the three-dimensional conformation. You add a phosphate group, boom, it changes, it's active now, right? Over here, addition of a second subunit. Simple, right? One subunit, two subunits, boom. You bring them together, you have an active molecule. Fifth one, unmasking. So here, simply, you have an inhibitor. If you phosphorylate the inhibitor, it undergoes a conformational shift, it comes off, this guy's active. Okay? Over here, now, stimulation of nuclear entry, right? So remember, these transcriptional activators, where do they function? Where? In the nucleus, right? Where the DNA is. So they have to come into the DNA, right? Well, again, if you have an inhibitor protein, in order for it to go through, you've got to remove this. It gets removed. This goes in. It's active. It binds to the DNA. It regulates transcription, right? And over here, in some cases, we find regulators that are released from the membrane, shown here. And again, notice we don't have all the details, right? And of course, part of them, when they dissociate, not dissociate, but break off, they become active regulators, and then they continue and affect transcription, basically, okay? So these are seven different ways of controlling the activity of the controllers, which are the regulators, right? And it doesn't matter whether they are activators or transcriptions, they are regulated in these different ways. Okay, so now we're gonna take that and apply it to cells, right? And what we see here is essentially the combinatorial gene control that creates many different uh, cell types. If we, before we even go through this, just the title, right? Combinatorial gene control, which means what, Chris? Right. It's the combination of gene activity, right? That essentially drives what? Well, the control of genes, many genes, that essentially gives rise to cell types, right? And that's what this picture shows here. So here is the embryonic cell. So we can think of this as a stem cell, obviously, right? And now you can see that some signal comes into this cell and induces the expression of regular tra transcriptional regulator number one, let's say, okay? So now this one, now when the cell divides, okay, one cell may inherit this transcriptional regulator number one, the other cell does not inherit it, right? So now transcriptional regulator is here, another signal can come in, and now you can induce transcription regulator two and three. Now, of course, two and three are going to be expressed here. Two and three are going to be expressed here as well because both cells receive the signal, correct? Both cells receive the signal. So you can see two and three here, two and three here. When they divide, maybe two will go here in this cell, maybe three will go in this cell. So clearly, this is a different type of cell than this different type of cell. Why? because of the presence of the regulators, right? And then on this side, you can see now you have three. One, two, three. Maybe one and two can go here. Maybe one and three can go in this one. Notice different cell type, right? And then other signals come into these four cells, which then induce more transcription of regulators to be active, in this case, four and five. So all of these cells will have four and five, but now when they divide, I don't have to go through it, you can see 2, 4, 2, 5, 3, 4, 3, 5, 1, 4, 2, 1, 5, 2, 1, 4, 3, 1, 5, 3. In essence, then, what we've created is what, Daniel? Like a bunch of different cells. Exactly, a bunch of different cells, right? But they all have a what? Common ancestor, <laughs> right? <laughs> right there, okay? So, the cell type, then, depends on the expression of specific regulators. And these specific regulators will essentially give you the final differentiated state of the cell. So this could be a neuron. This could be a liver cell. This could be an osteoblast. This could be a skeletal myocyte. This could be a cardiomyocyte. This could be a fibroblast. This could be an endothelial. 
This should be able to kill yourself. Yes, Daniel. Are, do we have any idea what kind of signals trigger the cells? Of, of course we do. <laughs> Tell me one. You know the answer to the question. Hormones. Yes, <laughs> good. Michael, tell me another one. Yes, growth factors, exactly. <laughs> and what's another one? <laughs> what's this? He's a cell, I'm a cell, right? I'm sending him signals now by tickling his hand. <laughs> right? Cell to cell interaction is also signals, right? And where do other cells come from? No. What am I doing here? I'm a cell. What? I'm interacting with this. What is this? Thank you, Chris. The extracellular <laughs> matrix, right? So signals come from the extracellular matrix, right? Exactly. So we have not only chemical signals, but we can also have physical signals, right? So if I go here and I put in a load, that's a physical signal. Is everybody clear? So now you can see how we end up with different cell types from a same cell by the activation of transcriptional regulators and how these transcriptional regulators essentially right, guide the differentiation of various cell types that we find in multicellular organisms, correct? And it's all, of course, what's missing here? What's the key? I want to see now who's thinking. The, <laughs> the question is, right, I've given you part of the puzzle. What is the other part in order for you to see the entire picture? Good. The genes that will be turned on by whom? By whom? By, by these regulators. Exactly, right? These regulators here will turn on different genes than these regulators, which will turn on different genes than this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, right? And that's why you end up with neurons, liver cells, epithelial, endothelial, osteoblasts, fibroblasts, and so forth. Is everybody clear? That's the missing part of the picture, right? You do puzzles? No, I don't. <laughs> you should. I do not have a puzzle. Okay, so is everybody clear? Yes? Uh, good. I'm gonna shut the picture here. I'm going to shut the lights off. So you can see here now that a perfect example of how we can take a liver cell, which is a fully differentiated cell, right? And by manipulating the levels of neuron specific transcriptional regulators, we can convert liver cells into neurons. Think about it, right? This is a differentiated cell, and we can deliver three specific genes that basically encode for nerve-specific transcription regulators, and we can convert liver cells into what? Neurons. Neurons. So what does this tell us? What does this tell us? It's a simple conclusion from this experiment. Not just the elements, the regulators. If you know regulators, you can manipulate cell types. Right? You can manipulate cell types. That's how powerful these regulators are. Yeah? You can only affect future generations of the cell type, or can you affect the actual cell itself? This cell will become this, right? Now, of course, these cells are terminally differentiated. They don't divide anymore because they're neurons, and we know neurons do not divide, right? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So now, if you take these neurons now, and you add, you somehow get rid of these transcription regulators, and you add liver, you can convert them back to liver cells, right? You can put liver-specific transcription regulators, and you can convert them back, huh. right? So again, so this tells us that the Transcription regulators control cell types, basically, right?
right? And of course, these three transcription regulators, what did they do inside the cells? Yes, exactly, affected gene expression, right? It affected many cells, so what did they do? They begin to turn on genes that are usually expressed in neurons. And that's why these cells became neurons, right? Because the regulators target neuronal specific genes, right? Okay, I love this slide here. Why do I love this slide here, right? Because it shows you the power that we have. So here is a Drosophila embryo, right? Normal fly. So here this group of cells will give rise to an adult eye. This group of cells will give rise to a leg. So what do we do here? We basically take some cells from here, right? And we make them uh, uh, um, express, essentially, some genes that are normally expressed here. And as a result, what do we end up with? An eye on the leg. An eye on the leg. Should I show you mine? <laughs> <laughs> so, an eye on the leg. No, it shouldn't be functional, right? Why? Because obviously, in order for the eye to be functional, it has to connect to the brain, and there's no brain there, right? So clearly, you get the eye structure there, right? So this is a fly with eyeless, that's what it's called, the gene eyeless, because when they deleted the gene, the flies had no eyes. So they called it eyeless, right? And essentially, it's these genes are artificially expressed in the cells that normally give rise to a leg, right? But now they also gave rise to an eye structure there. Okay? Wait, the eyeless gene triggers the formation of eyes? Yes. That's needlessly complicated. It's amazing. <laughs> of course it is, right? Okay? So what it does, basically, it essentially, because it's a transcriptional activator, what it does, it activates a group of genes that will turn these cells into eye cells, right? And that's what you see there. Pretty amazing, right? So the expression of the Drosophila eyeless gene in precursor cells of the leg triggers the development of the eye on the leg. And they've done this with legs on the heads. Yes, when they move cells from uh, from here that express different regulators, they put them there, and all of a sudden you have a fly where instead of antennas, they have legs on their heads. <laughs> yeah, pretty amazing stuff. Okay, so is everybody clear? So now, this one here tells us, right, that if you have a combination of transcription regulators, you can induce a differentiated cell to de-differentiate, which is what we showed before with the liver cells becoming neurons, right? And, but in here, it goes one step further. You go from a differentiated state to a stem cell, a non-differentiated, right? A pluripotent cell, which is a stem cell, basically, right? Pluripotent cells are stem cells. So here now we have a fibroblast which is a skin cell, right? Differentiated. And you basically transfect, you deliver genes for OCT4, SOX2, KL4. All of these are transcription regulators, regulators, right? Once you transfect them there, you basically allow the cells to grow and divide the culture, and it becomes what is known as an IPS cell, which stands for induced pluripotent stem cell, exactly, induced pluripotent stem cell. And this induced pluripotent stem cell behaves like a stem cell. So if you change the chemical environment, you can convert the cell into a muscle cell. If you use different chemical signals, hormones, growth factors, you can convert it into a neuron. Different chemical signals, you can convert it into a fat cell. So, look where we started, with a fully differentiated cell. We converted it into a pluripotent stem cell, which then can be converted into other cell types. Now, why is that, right? Because we know that these transcription factors here, the transcription or regulators, can control the expression of many genes I'm gonna show you in just a second. But the important point is what? There's one other thing here that I haven't mentioned yet. 
very important point. What do we know? And here's my question, a direct question to you guys. What do we know about the DNA in this cell, this cell, or any of these cells? Yes, they're all the same. Exactly, right? So what is the difference is what genes are expressed in this cell, what genes are expressed in this cell, and what genes are expressed in, in this cell, right? And what controls the expression of genes are transcriptional regulators, exactly. Boom, there it is, right here. So what does this show us here? Diana, what does this show us, Diana? Uh, Don't look at that, look at that bigger. Okay. <laughs> um, it shows how different transcription regulators are interacting with each other. Excellent. Time. That's one observation. It shows us how these, these different transcription regulators interact with each other. Correct. So KL4 interacts with SACS2. KLF4 interacts with OK4, OK4 can interact with SAX2. And what else do you see in this just here? They interact with themselves. Yes, they interact with themselves, exactly. Self-interactions. Good. What's another? What is another observation based on, on, on this data here? What, what do we see here in A? Be more specific. Excellent. Each transcriptional regulator, right? Each transcriptional regulator controls essentially a large set of genes. Conclusion number two, right? So each one of, of these green dots here represents a gene that is controlled by these regulators. And what's the third conclusion based on this data? Jessica, what's the third conclusion? Powers of observation. Over here, focus over here. Don't look anywhere else, just here. You need help? Rahul, what do we see here? What's another conclusion based on this data? Excellent, excellent, excellent. This group of genes, this group of genes, this group of genes are affected by multiple transcriptional regulators. So these guys here are affected by KL4, OP4. This one here are affected by what? All three, exactly, right? All three. This one's by KL4 and SOX2. So each one has its own target genes and also common genes that you see here. Three regulators. Count the green dots. <laughs> so would you say we have hundreds of dots? And each dot represents a different gene? So in other words, these three regulators control what? Not all the genes, <laughs> but hundreds of genes, right? And that's why they're able to de-differentiate this cell and make it a stem cell. So could you say that there are more genes than transcription genes? Of course. Transcription regulators are very few, but they're very powerful. In the hierarchy of genes, transcription regulators are on the top because they control everything. Okay, Chris, you're with me? Good. You present the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now this one here shows us how a single transcription regulator can control many genes, which is basically of this slide here. So here is one, one regulator turn, controlling all of these genes and co controlling these genes, these genes, and these genes, right? So we're going to focus on this one now, right? So there it is. Here is, for example, gene 1, gene 2, gene 3. And when they're in this orientation with transcription regulators, different ones, bind to different regulatory elements, 
the genes are expressed at lower levels, correct? Now, over here now, what do we see? We see that essentially a signal comes in, and this signal is a hormone, glucocorticoid, right? Now, the hormone itself has a receptor. So, the receptor, fine. Now, glucocorticoids are what type of molecules? I know the hormones, but what type? Are they just like testosterone? An estrogen, right? They go through the membrane because they're lipids, right? They're lipids. So they go through the membrane and then they bind to an intracellular receptor as opposed to a membrane bound receptor. This receptor is inside the cell. It binds to it and then together they move into the nucleus and they behave like, according to this, Olivia, they behave like, yes. Transcriptional regulators, exactly. So the signal itself, with its receptor, becomes a complex together with other regulators, and essentially now 